All right, so um, the Pokemon series actually has grown up with us, and I have evidence to it. Uh, jeez. <laughs> this is going to fly in the face of all, of all of the Sword and Shield hot takes, isn't it? Yeah, it is, uh, because I thought a lot about Sword and Shield and about how initially it was pretty disappointing with, um, I guess, just the entire thing of it. The Dexit was like a really bad foot to start on, and from there it kind of went downhill with some of the characters but you need to hear me out. So Pokemon is turning 25 this year. I don't know a lot of 25 year olds who have their shit together, but Pokemon is trying to get its shit together and for the past six years has been doing a pretty okay job at it. And it also kind of peaked when it was 12. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So I'm gonna take you through it. So Pokemon has more of like childhood star syndrome right now? Yes. So, Pokemon, when it was very young, was incredibly popular. It was like a really popular baby. I don't have one in regular media to kind of reference, but it just... just Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda! <laughs> He's a really popular baby. I don't know how old Baby Yoda actually is. I've never seen The Mandalorian, but whatever. Baby Yoda. So, it's really popular as a baby. It gets even more popular as it starts growing up, and it can say catchphrases on the television show, like Mary-Kate and Ashley. And then... I was going to go with... Like, I don't know, maybe Gary Coleman? Gary Coleman? Oh, yeah, that works, too. I forgot that he was also a child actor. I, I, I had a, almost completely scrubbed Mary-Kate and Ashley from my memory, so thank you. They, they was Full House. They were both the same character on Full House. <laughs> right. Um, so then we get to third gen, which is kind of like pre-teen years for Pokemon. Third gen and fourth gen are kind of the pre-teen years, and it kind of loses its way a little bit, kind of falls out of the main public face, but it's still pretty popular. Like, Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum did not not sell, but they weren't selling the, at the heights of uh, Red and Blue and Gold and Silver. Then Black and White comes out when it's like a teen, like a little after the pre-teen years, and it kind of peaks because it's the culmination of everything. Like, the, in fourth gen, they, they did gods, and so, like, how do you top gods with the Pokemon that we made? You tell a good story. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and so they did. And they told a good story twice. Black 2 isn't as good of a story, but it's still a good story. So then we get to X and Y. Early adulthood. It loses its way completely. Oh my like, god. <laughs> like, like X and Y was... Is, is like a good video game in the sense that like it's fun to play because there's stuff to do and you can interact with things and as a video game should but there's no story there's no character development there's no there's almost no memorable characters it's it's kind of like the proof of concept of pokemon in a 3d environment when they already had one in coliseum and xd but we'll scratch that for now and then um we get to sun and moon and sun and moon it starts to find its way again because sun and moon is x and y but with a better story and more fleshed out characters. And now we're at Sword and Shield. In Sword and Shield, Pokemon is a 25 year old who's trying to get back on their own path. They're trying some new things. Not all of them are working out, obviously, but they did learn some good lessons from their early adulthood. Like, hey, remember, we gotta tell a good story. Remember when we did that that one time and it worked? <laughs> we gotta do it again. And Sword and Shield initially doesn't have a good story but it does retain the character depth that Sun and Moon had. I, Marnie immediately comes to mind, so I want to argue, but like virtually everybody else is, is fairly okay. Mm, I think Bede has a really good character arc. Bede, yeah, Bede's great. Hop is fine. He's just kind of... I think Hop is redeemed in the DLC. Okay. I don't like him still, but that's just a personal thing. I don't like him because he's bad. I, I, it's not that I don't like him because he's bad. I just don't personally like Hop. I would not hang out with Hop. <laughs> that's fair. And then we've also got Piers. We've also got Leon. We've also got... And the, and the, these are characters that aren't just memorable because they have wacky out there designs, but because like they actually do stuff. Like, Piers has a little bit of an arc where like he starts an evil team, quote-unquote evil, to support his sister and he's a gym leader and then he steps down like why <laughs> so that's my that's the biggest hot take i've ever dropped even though we're only in the second episode <laughs> right uh it's a good it's a good hot take i think um i think that's 
that's probably partially true because Pokemon is growing up with us, but it's also from like a corporate standpoint watching us grow up and it's yeah. not really sure what to do with that because I think I think just as much as we don't want to lose the Pokemon that we grew up with as Pokemon becomes its own thing, I think there's parts of Pokemon that don't want to lose us either but they know that from a marketability standpoint they they know what the winning formula is. Yeah, I think that that's true. And I think that they also got a, they got scared with what the winning formula is once Pokemon Go came out and made 7 billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they were very worried and shaken up by that fact when we had world peace for a week in 2016 <laughs> because Pokemon Go came out. Like <sighs> Like, it's kind of ridiculous that that happened and that they were responsible for this and they didn't intend for it to happen. They they were the greatest cultural phenomenon twice. Yeah, twice. <laughs> you don't get that. You never get that. You get one cultural phenomenon and Pokemon got it twice. And it might happen again. We don't know. So anything could happen at this point. I think you're right with them not wanting to lose us to a certain extent and them not having the winning formula. But I also think that the younger market isn't always going to be the biggest. Because yes, the younger kids will buy toys and they'll buy cards. And that's how Pokemon makes most of its money is through merchandising, not just the video game. Right. But you know who has a lot of disposable income and likes to buy Pokemon shit? The parents of the new generation. Who like Pokemon. Right. And if you keep them in, they have a lot of money to buy Pokemon shit. Like the $40 Raihan plushies. <laughs> Oh, I forgot that was real. Yeah, like, they finally started making decently to high quality tr plushies of the trainers. That's not for the kids. That's for the, sh that's for the parents or the young adults, the 20-something-year-olds like Pokemon. Yeah, where you get your, your stuffed waifu or husbando. Yeah, and put them on your shelf and you get the serotonin when you look at them. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. So, anyways, uh, that's episode two of It's Still Cool. My name is Tony. And my name is Jesse. And this is a podcast where we talk about things that we enjoy with a little bit of a critical eye, but also sometimes just talking about them without some sort of critical eye. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun balance to strike when you're one half talking out of your ass and one half um, a borderline encyclopedic knowledge of the subject. <laughs> This is a weird existence to be in, but if you enjoy it, you will share our pain. <laughs> so, to... If you have been following us so far, we have some patch notes from the last episode. Oh, we uh, definitely do. So, this is, uh... In order to help with that aforementioned balance of uh, talking out of our ass and encyclopedic knowledge, um, we went and looked up a bunch of the things we weren't sure about on the last episode. Um, and... Uh, what were the, it was the it was the commercials at the end of the Pokemon VHSs that it, gave us like a haunted feeling. Yeah, it was the negative aura surrounding the yeah. the VHS commercials at the end of the Pokemon VHSs. And then it was Japanese Pokemon fan comics. Yes, Japanese Pokemon fan comics. Did we were, find did we wind up finding a Japanese Pokemon fan comic that was aside from uh, dating a magma grunt? Yes, uh, uh, Champions, not Champions Path. Oh, Festival of Champions? Fe Festival of Champions. That was, okay, that's right. So we found Festival of Champions, and we haven't read it. We I haven't, haven't read it. I've never read it either, okay. but I've seen uh, pages of it posted on various websites, and it looks very high quality and fun. There is a fan sub, or not fan sub, a fan <laughs> translation that isn't going as quickly, but also Festival of Champions, I think, releases maybe twice a year. So it's not coming out with a lot of like like it, it's a very slow burn so uh if, you, if you're interested in that you can go check that out and then uh as for the <laughs> as for the negative aura um commercials so yeah so pokemon vhs tape ends and weird commercials start there'll be a commercial for the pokemon game you know the one where they're in the where the bus driver crams them into a bus and then puts them in a compactor and he makes the pokemon red or blue cartridge yes um so then after that, so we went, and after the episode, we went and, like, we literally just, it, it hadn't occurred to me to just go on YouTube and look for commercials after Pokemon VHS, but sure enough, if any of you want to be, like, moderately unsettled at the fact that these, 
these were at the end of like Pokemon of all things because they weren't sure what they were doing. The distribution team had no idea what the target audience was going to wind up they being. They still didn't even know that Pokemon was going to be a phenomenon yet. Yeah. Like the first localization to Pokemon still didn't know the juggernaut that it was going to be. And so, so you have these really tonally dissonant advertisements at the end. The one is a, it was actually a Ranma half movie. movie. It was a movie. It was like movie four or something. And it, I think it, it unsettled me as a kid. We determined that it was unsettling because it was so culturally contextless. Because Ranma takes so much from Chinese mythology. Yeah. And there was just like a lot of stuff. And the idea was like, this is not for us. Yeah. And that's why we felt awkward watching it. And then the second... The second advertisement was for an anime adaptation of the Dogs of Flanders. Yeah. Oh my god. And it was incredibly sad. It just and the and the trailer just told the whole story. Yeah, like, like kid loves art, his dad's a dick, his grandpa's dying. If he wins an art contest, there's a nun and it's the like the city burns down. Or not the city, the town, like the little village yeah. burns down, and he you watch him grow up and there, there are dogs. There's the, we couldn't quite figure out how the dog factored. It was just bizarre. But uh, both of them were not for the Pokemon audience. The audience that the Pokemon audience would eventually become. Yes, very young children. Yeah. So the the that that would explain why, as a kid, I stood there and was like, "This is the same feeling I get when like I don't know." It was like it was like when I would sneak in to see, like, my parents had fallen asleep and I would sit and watch the X-Files and I realized how in over my head I uh-huh. was. <laughs> or, if you could relate to this too, if you're somewhere in the age range of 25 to 30, if you remember watching Adult Swim at night, in, like, if you had access to a TV. Oh, yeah, you're like you're like 12 and your mom puts a TV in your room because she thinks you'll be responsible and yeah. then you're not. Yeah, and then you're not, but you're not responsible because you're watching, like, HBO or whatever. You're not responsible because you just leave Cartoon Network on and then Adult Swim comes on and it's not for you and it's very apparent that it's not for you. I would, I would argue that, like, sitting in on a TV show that's not for you is a little bit different than having like a commercial try to tantalize you into something that's not for you. Yeah. Um, because the the Adult Swim draw that kind of happened, that weird ethereal negative aura yeah. haunting feeling, uh, it kept us there. Yeah, that's true. It was <laughs> enthralling. Like, despite it being scary, it was like a good horror film where it is scary, but you want to keep watching it. Yeah, and so experiences with things like, well, obviously, Fooly Cooly being the big the big ticket item on mm-hmm. Adult Swim for people in our, our age demographic who were, like, just budding teenagers. Yes. When a show about the abstract concept of being a budding teenager. <laughs> that is also incredibly silly and has probably the best OST to an anime that ever existed. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh dog. So to to continue riffing off of this point though, because I know we're gonna probably dedicate a full episode to Fooly Cooly. Probably. Um So to riff off of the idea, uh my brother and I also had so my my dad had the weird cable that okay. was like Oh, like the pirate cable? No, not that weird. Okay. It was just like it was non standard cable, it was a lot. It was like the channels into the thousands, but it's like it cycles back around to being the same content and as half before. of the channels are just the radio yeah, yeah it was okay. weird but so what we had was we had tech tv yeah before <laughs> it was g4 yeah and tech tv had anime unleashed mm-hmm. where they would randomly show like a handful of episodes of some fuck off anime yes and i got exposed through that too because that that brought about a lot of the weird stuff mm-hmm. i watched um better man have you heard of yeah, better man yes and I don't know how much of... Be- like, I had no concept of how far into the show it was when I caught it, right? Mm-hmm. But Better Man felt like um, like House of the Dead 4, yeah. where you're like, you spend the back portion of the game in, like, ascending an office building, and then, the you know, it was my first experience with something like that. I know that Final Fantasy has been doing that for ages. Yeah. But Better Man was particularly unsettling um, in that regard, and we had uh, Magical Shopping Arcade of Itabashi. Yes. Which was like, I almost I almost want to say that a Benabashi could be like a spiritual successor to Fooly Cooly. A little. In in that regard, where it's like, once you've seen Fooly Cooly, now you know there's weird anime, yeah. and a Benabashi kind of sort of has the same themes of like a fantasy interpretation of like having to grow up. Yeah. Um, 
but of course a Benabashi is a lot less uh fooly cooly. I don't know how to like Fooly Cooly is punk. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a lot a Benabashi is a lot less punk. There like, you go. Fooly Cooly is is very much punk personified in an anime and not a lot of anime capture that. And that's esoteric right now, but I'm going to refer back to that when we do our Fooly Cooly episode. Of course. That Fooly Cooly is punk and a lot of anime is not punk. <laughs> This, uh, this only furthers our, uh, <laughs> our toxicity uh, nickname scheme. Exactly! <laughs> ah, it just works. It just works, dude. So, yeah. Um, what... Because some of these shows, like, my, my cousin, when we were kids, he showed me Trigon and Inuyasha. Okay. And it was around the same age I had discovered Fully Cooly, right? Yeah. And Inuyasha had, like, bird like half naked women and their lower half is an entire spherical bird yes. and and sango and sango and they're they're in a they're in a setting that's clearly de- derived from a mythology that I'm unfamiliar with mm-hmm. and then he showed me trigon and trigon is like the, the most western the the old west in the future in outer space yeah. and it's like cripplingly depressing for reasons that are so introspective I don't know if I would have understood at the time yeah um it's also kind of Chris Got a lot of Christian iconography with Wolfwood. Sure. Yeah. Um. But I, I, it's crazy that these are shows that weren't meant for a Western demographic, and it's very possible. And it happens with a lot of people. A lot of people who try and get into anime bounce off of it because a lot of anime isn't meant for a Western demographic. But even as a kid, as kids, we were able to be immersed in these worlds despite them being pretty foreign to us and not being developed for our minds and if you look at the two if you look at two of the biggest impactful general audience anime you have pokemon where even though the first season had a lot of japanese mm-hmm. iconography in it yeah it was a pretty um, globalized globalized thing like even even in the beginning they they didn't it wasn't set in japan it wasn't a specific like japanese there cultural a lot of temples in the kanto region like the bit, the the most temple you got was the Pokemon Tower, and even then that was converted to like a haunted house in the anime yeah. version. Yeah, and the the Ghost of Maiden's Peak episode yeah, does a bunch of Japanese ghost stuff, like the charms and. But it, but it but Misty also uses a cross and yeah. and like vampire. Yeah, stuff. there's like a vampire joke. But the uh, and so Pokemon, it's just sort of like, well, these are cool monsters, and we we get that, we yeah. get that, and then the other. And this is this is a little bit before our time specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one that I feel like came and made a good general appeal in the West without needing a lot of context was Gundam. Yeah, because you don't need to. It's it's robots in space, and it's a military drama. Yeah, and everybody can get that. Mm-hmm. I think more at a certain less. age. Yeah, more or less. Like if you're young, you like it for the robots, and if you're older, you like it for this like diverse character interaction in space, like. Because, like, those character arcs hold up almost 30 years, 40 years later. Like, it's crazy that they still hold up. Yeah, so I think with a lot of a lot of anime kind of being more, you know, tied to its roots in Japan, uh, during a certain era, uh, I think Gundam and Pokemon stood out as having an edge with general audience appeal kind of in a weird way we also never got a lot of the anime that was aimed for kids in japan like there is anime that is made for kids in japan yeah we never got a lot of it we never got doraemon we never we we got the raunchy version of crayon shinchan like (laughs) like like crayon shinchan it's kind of for kids in japan like it still has adult humor in it but not like the dub did with it over here like, oh yeah! No, oh god! The, the dub for Crayon Shin Chan is almost like the Ghost Stories dub. <laughs> where, I don't think I realized that. Yeah, no, the Crayon Shin Chan aired on Adult Swim over here because they decided to take the property and go bonkers with it. I think they did the same thing with Super Milk Chan. Like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Super Super Milk Chan struck me as like almost anime run and stimpy. Yeah, no, a little tone. bit. Um, but yeah, so we never got a lot of the... I think Pokemon was the first breakout anime over here that was a that was an anime that was actually designed for children in Japan. Hmm. Like, because we... Uh, I, I, I imagine that people tried with other anime that were designed for kids to break them out over here, 
but they didn't get nearly as big. Like, we did get Flint the Time Detective. Like, we did get other anime that were aimed at for kids. But, but later. But later, and not they were never as popular. Yeah. And what broke the ground for that was Pokemon. God, Flint the Time Flint Flint the Time Detective is one of those shows that I was I was convinced I had completely hallucinated because <laughs> no. nobody else talked about it. Man, that I don't want to go into Flint the Time Detective. But yeah, no, no. Good. Um, but going back to the idea of of watching stuff that's not meant for you, actually, uh, I used that kind of anime logic, like because. I felt like anime, it was always kind of wrong to watch anime that wasn't Pokemon because it did kind of feel like it was for adults. It did kind of feel like it wasn't for me. I never had tech TV when I was growing up, but when I was like a young teenager, we got on demand. And that was after G4 had already like taken over tech TV. Mm -hmm. So G4 didn't really have that much anime on it. It had some anime, but I never watched it. But what I did do with, with on demand, if you went to the G4 section of the on demand section, like what G4 provided through the on demand service, it had a lot of anime in there. And I saw one named Gravitation. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 exactly where I'm going with this. <laughs> I'm like, well, I wonder what this anime is about. And I watched the first episode, and I'm like, oh, oh. So I then proceeded to wake up earlier than everybody in my house just so I could watch Gravitation. Hell yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, I am not allowed to watch this. For sure. I am not allowed to watch this show, but I really want to watch it. And that's like a, this isn't for me, but in a much more understandable fact. Like, this yeah. is a deep, like, ro tense romance yeah. show. Yeah, definitely. And I'm like, I'm not, definitely not allowed to watch this show. Mm. But instead of it being, a, like, scary and being enrapturing, it was like dangerous and enrapturing sure <laughs> and i'm like oh oh it's a you're not supposed to be here like uh like watching into walking into like an adult romance film that also has sex scenes in it yeah like, I, as opposed to i'm not supposed to be here like walking into area 51 yeah which is what most of the anime felt like yeah it kind of did like and i think about more anime that were on adult swim that i bounced off of because they were too scary like i, I didn't like wolves reign i didn't like blue gender like all those shows were too scary for me because i knew that i wasn't getting it yeah and a lot of those like even the the i remember the advertisements for wolf's reign it was like hey listen kids this one's gonna be really fucking violent yeah <laughs> Like, like we know you we know you're on here but don't watch yeah, Wolf's Rain. Yeah, we know you're on here but there's other anime that just watch Cowboy Bebop because that's still kind of silly. Yeah. Like We know you're here cuz you you they've got Toonami drawing you yeah. like searching for more yeah, but like nah. every Saturday we know you are here. We know you're here from Toonami. You're hot off the heels of Rafe Master and Bobobo. <laughs> like because that's what they ended the Toonami block with. Because oh. those were the least rated shows in yeah. terms of like watchability. <laughs> Wow, I wonder why. I wonder why. It's almost like they weren't made for a Western audience. <laughs> poor, poor both of those shows. It's okay. The creators are doing fine. Yeah. The guy who made Rave Master is doing Hunter Hunter now, and it's like becoming one of the most popular animes. So he's fine. I think I might be wrong. I is might have to do patch notes for that. Hunter Hunter. I think it's Fairy Tale. Or Fairy Tale. I'm seeing. I was wrong. Hunter Hunter's Hunter is a different yeah, guy. Yeah, Hunter Hunter's a different guy. But yeah, you know he's doing. He did Fairy Tale, which yeah. was very, very popular. So he's fine. Bobo Bo guy probably had his fun. Like <laughs> I don't know what he's doing, but he's probably okay. I remember wanting to like Bobo Bo when it came out, and it just was a little too much, a yeah. little too wacky. Yeah. And that was, of course, like after Zatch Bell had already pushed that envelope mm -hmm. just enough. Zatch Bell was Zatch Bell was like, hey, we have the serious premise, we have the serious idea, and then like, here's 37 episodes of uh, Conchome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the do the the horse, the yeah. horse one. <laughs> let's let's just let's just keep up the goofy, and then all of, like we're gonna lose our audience, and then they're like, oh shit, we should maybe introduce this plot point, and then it was too late. Yeah, like, nobody cared. And they 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 bounced off of it too much, and Bubble Bo was definitely. Uh, hey, let's take a, let's take this gag manga from Jump and animate it, and then the Western audiences were like, "What's Jump?" <laughs> and th when they animated it, they're like, "Well, we can't keep any of the Jump jokes because we don't have the copyrights for the anime of those series." Uh oh, that's half of our show. Like, <laughs> <sighs> like Bobo Bo is supposed to be a Jump manga because that's all it exists as. Right. Okay. Well, that would make 
that would make sense because they, they just didn't see the appeal. Like all of the all of the humor they tried to present in Bobo Bo was like, okay, this is what Bobo Bo needed uh, in the English, and it wouldn't have made it a good show. But what it needed is every five seconds after a joke happens, they need to stop the show, and Beauty needs to come out and be like, in Japan, this is what the joke was. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love seeing that in like in translated yeah. manga editors notes this joke doesn't have a, an analog in yeah. English so mm. here's kind of what they were going for yeah like beauty would have had to stop the action every 10 to 15 seconds to explain the joke yeah and it just wouldn't work so it, they did what they could I think they had some good voice actors in that show for sure and now when I search Don patch and there's the video game series Don patchy I always get mixed up <laughs> Oh yeah, there is a shoot 'em up video game series ah. called Don Pachi. Because it couldn't have been something even remotely like. No, no. And so when I'm like, I want to Google my my fun, my fun favorite character from Bobo Bo, Don Patch, and it's like, nope, you get this. Uh, there was a. Um, I feel like that's uh, that's like the the internet landmine. If you misspell anything, it's mm. automatically you wind up at porn. Oh yeah, you're you're always one step away from it. I remember there was a, there was a blog I was reading that was doing a Bionicle fan fiction, oh. like back in like 2005. Oh my god! So back before a lot of the story got explained, yeah. and there was still a lot of room to kind of there do what mystery. you wanted. Yeah. Then um, I went to go look for them later, and their blog was gone, and it redirected me to porn, and I was like, mm, I don't want this quite yet. <laughs> Not ready for it quite yet. And sometimes you're not even one step away. Sometimes you're in the same Google search. Yeah. Sometimes you want to look up a character from a Nintendo game. And you can't. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we're like treading into that. Like everybody, everybody is aware of the trope of the Rule 34 of the fact that there is there is no sanctity. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just kind of, I think the part to me that's weird, because it's not weird that that... It no. is the way it is. It feels very natural, especially growing up on the internet. We're just kind of used to it. But the fact that it's so... Um, the fact that it pops up so much in Google image searches, which you would think would at least, like, pretend to try to be filtered. Yeah, they try. I think for a little bit, they tried. But now, they obviously do not. Yeah. Like... And that's the part where I think it's, like, that's a little bit weird. Um, is. Which is unfortunate, because you're going to wind up... You're, you're going to wind up with a whole generation of kids who are stumbling upon things and they're going to be like, okay, I, again, I didn't need this yet. <laughs> like, why does this look like this? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I'm awakening feelings. <laughs> oh, man. I remember, I remember as a kid, because again, we're still, we're still kind of orbiting that, like, we're not supposed to be here. Yeah, that's uh, kind of the theme right now. And, uh, we're managing to cling tenaciously to this sort of abstract... Yeah, no, we're here. ...premise. We're in the premise. Um... There was a Sonic News fan site. I don't remember what it was called. Okay, was it SNN Sonic News Network? No, it okay. wasn't like a. It, it was probably before that. Okay. Um, but as like on the front page, there was like low quality like MS Paint fan art of like Sonic and Knuckles and Tails as girls. Okay. But like <sighs> Knuckles had like really absurdly large breasts and were they wearing clothes yeah they were wearing clothes okay. and it was just there was just something about the whole scene of it where like it was trying to it, it didn't have any speech bubbles but the characters were clearly like interacting engaging in some fashion okay and i remember my friend and i just sort of like immediately closing the web page because we were like that we we're, we're not sure what that was about but yeah. we're certain that's not why we were here yeah like that's not why we're here and that's not why we're gonna come back who, who is this for yeah and, like, I think that's something to remember is, like, when we were growing up with the internet, there were people who were older than us right now who were using it back then. And that's what a lot of the internet used to be for. So, like, that's something weird to remember is that, like, it's easy to think that, like, when you're going on the internet, everybody on the internet is going to be, like, the same age as you roughly, mm -hmm. especially back then when the internet was smaller. But even then, we were still the minority on the internet. The internet was made for, like, 30-something-year-olds doing whatever they wanted and it's crazy <laughs> yeah Whew. and that's why it felt so wrong to be on someone's sites like even deviant art was like the wild west out there that's true 
it, much as DeviantArt like attempted to censor uh -huh. its, its no. more risque work. Uh -uh. And I think the same problem there is the same problem we have with the the Google image search is where because a lot of the a lot of the top images you'll see of like your favorite characters are them uh, fat or them with like a close up on their feet because it's not technically porn but yeah. oh boy we still really oh would rather yeah. that not be the first thing that and comes up. And DeviantArt was more accepting of that stuff because for it didn't have the same it didn't have the same stigma that mm. Fur Affinity had at the time. And and audience listening at home, no uh, no judgment if that's like oh, what yeah, you're no, about. I, I'm not going to yunk anybody's yum here on the podcast, but what we're saying is that if we were going to these websites not for these things, and then we encounter these things as young individuals without the with, without the experience to be able to sort them out, it wasn't great. <laughs> it was it was it, it gave us that we shouldn't be here yeah, feeling. It gave us. A negative aura. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. But it kept us coming back. <laughs> yeah, and eventually, you know, eventually we all developed into into weirdos in our own regards. Yeah, we're uh, all weirdos now. And we're and we're all like, we all have the context to go on and you know Google image search our favorite character from Pokemon, and there's a close up of their feet, and we're just like, okay, well, I I at least know why this is here now. Yeah, like, and also it doesn't like negatively affect me as much anymore. Yeah, I don't I, like fall out of my computer chair and like need to go. Like, like do something outside. else. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I, I have grown an immunity to the negative aura now. Because the more so, the more so than like the, it's not for you. It's like you don't even understand why it's not for you, yeah. and you can't. No, you can't. You don't have any context as to why this was made, who this is for, and why it's here. And so now we have like we have a whole generation of people who are desensitized to everything on the internet like I, a little scary i think to i think to some of our younger friends who are like oh yeah, yeah here's some stuff from my like gore account on, yeah. on tumblr and we're like you're what on where now yeah like i had to explain to one of our younger friends that people make art literally just to fap to and he was surprised by that and I'm like, I don't understand how you're surprised by this. And by younger, we mean the kids 19. Yeah. Somebody that we know from conventions that just happens to be in our in our in our friend group, larger internet friend group that, you know, where we're gonna all be through that. Like somebody will make a joke that seems very normal to everyone else, and then it slips our mind that we have a 19 year old with us sometimes, and it's like, oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah just yeah. Mm -hmm. just ignore that. You gotta you gotta remember, <laughs> adults are dumb. Zing. Tolkien defense, right? That's yeah. such. That's like every South Park episode ever, where the kids stumble upon adult stuff. That's the explanation. Adults are dumb. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> God, yeah. I guess the theme for today really is that whole. It's both growing up, and experiencing things when you're not when you don't have the context to understand why you're experiencing the thing. Um, so... Then again, theme doesn't have to be that. Yeah, but continuing to, like, loosely bounce off of these ideas, mm -hmm. um, there's also kind of, not like an inverse problem, mm -hmm. I guess it is kind of an inverse problem, Yeah. where back, back in, like, the early days, where media was made and they didn't quite know how to... They, they didn't quite know what was going to be disturbing and what was not going to be okay. disturbing. So, a friend of mine who's a little bit older, she's more from the, like, the era of uh, fan-dubbed VHS rips of Sailor oh, Moon. Oh, yeah, like the, 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 the quote-unquote dark uh, underside of anime piracy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Before official distribution. Exactly. And so she comes with knowledge from that era, a uh, good friend of mine, um... And it's just, we, we had a night where we were sitting around trying to, like, we were doing exactly what, um, what, what we were doing at the, uh, at, with the, with the Dogs of Flanders, with the old yeah. Pokemon VHSs. Yeah. We were going back into, like, forbidden memories and trying to, trying to make sense of stuff. And so she showed us this show called Noozles, which was an anime about koalas. Okay. Except the koalas were from another dimension called Koala Walla Land, which okay. had... It was like a hollow earth world where it was like reverse, so like you could like float up into the center of their world and the center of their world was 
So, mind you, this is like old school, like... This is like 80s anime. 80s anime with much more of a, like, a lighter pastel yeah. palette. Uh-huh. Um, like a Kimba the White Lion kind yeah. of animation style. Uh-huh. And the koalas got into, like, cute mischief with the kids on okay. Earth, but then sometimes they would go to Koala Walla Land. And Koala Walla Land was, like... It had other sentient animal people, but it was just, like, a little bit hostile. Oh, like, that's a little scary. A little, yeah. Like, the they would have to, like, avoid certain people. It's like, oh, is he not cool? Yeah, he's so not cool, he'll eat you. Oh, um, my God. But then you find out that, like, the, the kid's grandpa had gone missing at some point. Was he in Koala Walla Land? He was in Koala Walla Land's freakish crystal prison, where, like, they find him and... He's in, like, a crystal sphere in the center of their, like, gravity. Yeah. And you just see, like, a, a fading shadow of him in a crystal ball. Like, you don't see any details. Oh, my gosh. It's like a silhouette that's, like, deteriorating and fading away as he's, like, talking to them. And, of course, it's like that, um... It's like that almost, like... <sighs> I wish I could call upon more cartoons from that era more more like weird 80s cartoons that have like that voice like the comforting old white dude voice okay you know the one is like don't be afraid like oh, like yeah. uh like land before time kind of like, like littlefoot's grandpa yeah okay, okay. where you have yeah, that yeah. kind of like like adult figure who's like calm calm uh, all the time yeah. and they're like don't be afraid it's going to be okay mm-hmm. my time here is ending but you know yeah and it's just it's it was one of those memories that my friend had, and she was like, yeah, I remember watching this and being so completely unsettled. Like, yeah. the show was cute, but then this one episode terrified me, and we never watched the show again. Yeah. And it's like all those all those dumb internet creepypastas, except it's actually it's sometimes real. real. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, oh, hyper-realistic Squidward's face. <laughs> but, uh. but no, like, the, the real creepiness factor is when you take a show from a culture where... The, the lines between children's media and adult media is much thinner and you localize it as something for the audience that it might not necessarily be. That the, that's the whole that's the whole disconnect. Yeah. And now we've wrapped around full circle when I'm thinking about more modern western media, they do shit like that now. Sure. Like I'm thinking like right now I'm thinking about like Adventure Time. Adventure Time was like the modern boon of the new age of cartoons, right? Oh yeah. Adventure Time does that shit. That's true. Like it gets really unsettling sometimes. And then they reveal that it's a post apocalypse. Like Right. <laughs> and even even before that, like they there's all sorts of unsettling imagery. I'm sure if Adventure Time was uh, was the show that my friend grew up with instead of uh, Noozles, yeah, it, there would have been the same like unsettling memory. Like I'm sure that that episode with the like early early on with the Lich, yeah, the really for the first Lich episode, yeah, the first Lich episode is unsettling. It's, it's just that we we're older and a little more desensitized. Yeah, but if like an eight year old was watching it and they weren't ex- they were existing in a world where it's not easy for an eight year old to be desensitized, like that would be very unsettling. Yeah. It's like um, it's like we are the 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 crew of, of kids on bikes in the eighties unraveling a supernatural mystery in their hometown that the adults are oblivious of. Except it's it's television program that was made for us, and yeah. it, it's just as terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, we're like the Lost Boys, but we're not vampires, and we're solving a mystery. Oh, there were um, there was another one that that my friend showed us where it was a movie. From like it was an like animated movie from Australia, okay. but it used like actual photographs as backdrops oh, and it animated characters on top of them. That's really unsettling already. And the one like it's about this little girl and she finds a beached whale. Oh. And she, like the whale is like crying. It's like old Sesame Street animation yeah. where it's just like really. It's it's blocky it, and not smooth. Yeah, it's lumpy and clumpy yeah. and bizarre. And I, we didn't get all the way through it because it was just, it was a little much. Yeah. Um, and she winds up, like, going into the ocean with the whale, and it's like a, you know, an imaginary adventure yeah. thing. But there was, there was one kid, there was, like, these two kids who start off as bullies, and then the, the, the main character, like, tells them to, to knock it the fuck off, yeah. and then they, they do, and okay. they wind up being, like, tolerable. Mm-hmm. And the one kid looks like a weird cartoon version of Eminem. <laughs> like bald or like balding no he just had like he had the big baseball cap and the baggy clothes and he just you know he was just like a a pasty white kid with that kind of like baggy dress sense and he just he just looked like him Mm -hmm. um 
But he talked like he he talked like he smoked like six packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> That's really good. Well, we didn't mean nothing by it. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, it was weird. And I can't remember the name of the movie. I think the name of the movie was either the name of the kid or the name given to the whale. So it, I bet if you Google it, you'll probably be able to find it. Yeah, yeah. Like Australian animated film Beach I'm, Whale. Yeah, I'm sure there can't mm. be too many things that fit the description. Yeah. No. So I uh, I think animation is like that as a whole because of animation is usually assigned to being a children's media but you can you can get really esoteric and frightening with animation even if you're not trying to yeah even if you're not trying sometimes to. especially when you're not trying oh, to oh yeah so uh, yeah i think that we we live in this uh, and i don't think that's gone away like i still think some of the scariest stuff happens in animation because it's it's a medium that isn't really meant for it but here it is. Like I think about like when I was like I would I felt a little bit of it. You know I ne- I haven't felt that I shouldn't be watching this feeling since I was like a, a young teenager. Sure. But I've felt very unnerved, and I've had to put animation down for a while because of the kinds of things that they can express in these kinds of stories. Like when I was watching Steven Universe, and uh, I started with like Steven and the Stevens, so I didn't really get a lot of the early explanation for. They don't give you much. Yeah. Most of the first season is nonsense and filler. Yeah. But when you learn about how a gem is alive, and then that they get shattered, I had to put it down for a little bit because I'm like, oh, this existence sucks. Like this, this sucks. Yeah. Like holy shit. Like, Rhinox has a a speech in Beast Wars, um, which. Which, mind you, Beast Wars was unsettling yeah. because it was early CGI. Uh, and it was scary enough as it is. And uh, But Beast Wars also was the first time Transformers got really deep. Mm-hmm. And after um, like after they fail to resuscitate a character that's trapped in a stasis pod, yeah. Rhinox goes into this like really esoteric speech. Yeah. And this was the first time it was elaborated on what it meant to be a Transformer, what okay. it meant to be Cybertronian. Yeah. Uh, and he says... Um, when a spark comes online, there is great joy. And, like, the background fades to black, and it's like a starscape, and as he unfails, uh, unfurls his hands, there's a spark in it, you know? Yeah. When a spark is extinguished, the universe weeps. And this is just, like, that was the yeah. first time we ever got an explanation as to what a, what a Cybertronian is, what a spark is. Yeah. Beast Wars developed that in this really sad little blurb from Rhinox after, after somebody, like, dies in front of them and it's their fault. Yeah. And they don't die in, like, a gruesome way. No, it's just, it's like being unable to resuscitate a comatose patient. Yeah. That kind of death. Yeah, where that it's, kind of death. It's not gruesome, but it's just as it's sad. sad and yeah. unsettling because you still feel powerless. Yeah. And so, yeah, like, I think I think them bringing the idea of a soul into this fun robot show, like, <laughs> like that's really scary and a little esoteric. Like, I don't know if you were young enough to catch the movie when it came out, because I didn't. But I heard that that movie fucked up a lot of people. It did. Like, it did. The, yeah. the, 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 80, the 1980s Transformers animated movie. Okay. Yeah. There. That's mine. Because yeah. I watched okay. that in like 2012. Okay. And I had to walk away. Yeah. I had to stand up and take a break. Mm-hmm. First of all, it's really long. It's really long. Um, But they just... They just kill them. Kill everybody. Uh-huh. They, they kill everyone. The earth is threatened. It's, it's the scale of like meaninglessness to the lives of these characters that everybody's been watching for ages yeah. is absurd. It's so... The sanctimony of everybody's favorite characters is disregarded. You could have a room full of your favorite Transformers toys and they all die in the movie in a split second and no one can stop it and no one can save them. Yeah. That's what's scary. That's the scary part. Yeah. No, that is 100% My most recent experience with that feeling is the goddamned 1980s Transformers animated movie. Oh my god! It's it is it is a trip. If you're a Transformers fan and you haven't seen it, please just. I was gonna say don't. Oh no, you owe it to yourself. You should experience that. You should have a wide range of experiences. But it's. I mean, I guess it's just it, it it. It signifies an era that really, really showcases how much Transformers was just a commercial. Yeah. Because it's like, here's all the characters that won't be on shelves anymore, and we get to show them all get murdered and then eaten by Unicron. Yeah, and that's a crazy to think about. Like, like they turned what is essentially a reboot for a commercial into something emotionally impactful. Emotionally distressing. Yes, not just impactful, but distressing. 
Um, speaking of distressing, that's apparently Orson Welles' last credited role during his life. Is the Transformers is, movie? He's Unicron. Oh my god. And he hated it. Oh no. He hated it so much. There's an interview where he like very, very passive aggressively like demeans his role in the movie. Oh um, no. I play a giant robot and I die by punching myself to death or something. Like by holes, yeah. punching holes in myself by accident and then I die. And he just like didn't care. Oh, man. So that's kind of a shame. That's kind of a fun fact, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, it's a fact. I don't know if it's very fun. <laughs> I'm having fun thinking about the fact. Okay, well, then there you go. Then this fact was fun for you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and they they were really pushing to make a new generation of things. They they kill Optimus. Spoiler yeah. alert, Optimus dies. So. <laughs> So it won't uh, be Optimus, the first and it won't be the last. Yeah, I know, right? He it dies might have in the first, but it won't be the last. He dies in every continuity. Yeah, and uh, and then they give the Matrix of Leadership to Hot Rod, Hot who was Rod. like the up and coming kid appeal character. Yeah. Um, before they decided to shift all the marketing to Bumblebee, mm-hmm. and uh, and then Hot Rod becomes Rodimus Prime, and they were gonna really push that with Hot Rod as the new leader, but they had such poor reception yep. that they undid all of that eventually and brought Optimus back. Mm-hmm. And that's when Transformers figured out, like... We could just do this thing over and over. That's that's sort of the birth of, yeah, consistent branding Yeah, for Hasbro. And they did try something new with Beast Wars. They did. And Beast Wars... Beast Wars was the first time that they got to really focus on story and growth rather than just commercials because... Or just commercializing the characters. Because Beast Wars was so insanely expensive to make yeah. because it was new CGI... They had a very limited cast. Yes. And so instead of it being, a, here's a new character every week for you to we buy. We have to show you this character being developed. And we have to make you care about them so that like in like several months when they're still on the show and the character's finally not sold out in the stores because he's the cool dinosaur, you'll still love him. Yeah. That's why they keep bringing Dinobot back in all these continuities. <laughs> Dinobot? Are they bring? I thought I saw when I was looking up those Transformer little toys. Dinobot, Dinobot was on there for some reason. So, unless that wasn't Dinobot. Well, so there's here's here we go. <laughs> so this is um, uh, my name is not Shazam. That's the trope. Okay. Uh, Dinobot is a specific character in Beast Wars. However, before Beast Wars and after Beast Wars, the Dinobots are a whole faction. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so they decided. Again, because they weren't worried about people being confused, I guess, they decided to name one character Dinobot. They decided to have a new Optimus and a new Megatron who are not old Optimus and old Megatron and essentially, like, fill fill all the same trope roles of characters. You know, yeah. we had a character that's like Starscream. We had a character that's like Bumblebee. Uh, or I guess Cheetor was more like Hot Rod at the time. And, um, and so they didn't really think about it potentially being confusing to have a character named Dinobot. Yeah. And there's a bunch of other dinosaur robots. Because <laughs> I think um, the Dinobots, they have a Tyrannosaurus and a Pterosaur, and they have Megatron in Beast Wars is a Tyrannosaurus, yeah. and they have Terrorsaur in yeah. Beast Wars is a Pterosaur, <laughs> and Dinobot is a raptor, and the Dinobot faction never had a raptor. It's it's, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess, okay. It's but a it's, Hasbro mess. But it's fine, because it was, again, it was Hasbro's first time doing any of yeah. these things, so now we have a streamlined idea of what is what in Transformers, to the point where we wind up with a lot of monotony. Transformers animated... And then Transformers Prime were back-to-back series in different continuities, but they had essentially the same cast for okay. the for the Autobots. Okay. It was uh, you had you had an Optimus, you had the introduction of Bulkhead in animated, and then the evolution of Bulkhead in Prime. You had uh, Bumblebee. Bumblebee, of course, Bumblebee who who talks in animated and then is like Does the, the Michael Bay thing, thing in yeah. Prime. And then you had a different motorcycle, but there was still a motorcycle. It was Prowl in Animated, and it was RC in Prime. Okay. And they made her a blue motorcycle because she's partnered with a human boy, and they didn't want him riding around on a pink in like a pink sports car. Because <laughs> <laughs> that would have mattered. Oh yeah, definitely. Meanwhile, they can have the weird punk rock foreign exchange Asian girl in Prime hang out with the literal like military green SUV wrecking ball hand yeah. bulkhead, and that's fine. It works. We can have a whole episode about, like, about the the fault of the gender binary in media, and I'm sure we could go to town on that for ages. Oh, definitely. Uh, one of my, one of my, 
favorite series of all time, Bionicle, the author has repeatedly gone on the record saying Bionicle is for boys. That's why their most characters are boys. And everybody, everybody in the fandom has always been like, "You're an idiot." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Pr- pretty much unanimously. Going back to Pokemon, the first female character who was in the first like three seasons is not like a girly girl character. Yeah, explicitly, like, and all the marketing is always Misty's a tomboy. Yeah, she's always. the tomboyest mermaid. Yeah, and she like none of her Pokemon are girly at all. Like, Staryu's a weird alien, <laughs> Psyduck's an idiot, and I guess Goldeen is the most girly Pokemon that she has. And then has. she got Togepi. And then she got Togepi, but Togepi's like a baby, like... Okay, but remember, baby, babies yeah, are baby toy. girl toys. Yeah, that's fine, I remember. <laughs> but then she gets, uh, then she gets Politoed. She does? Yeah, in, God. in Gold and Silver. I stopped watching Pokemon mm-hmm. so much earlier than everyone else, she, apparently. She gets Poliwag before Johto. She gets Poliwag in the Orange Islands. Oh. And she did, it's a Poliwag for a long time, and then when Johto starts, it evolves into Poliwhirl, and it's Poliwhirl for a while, and then she gets King's Rock. The, and then, I guess in Johto, she also gets, like, the second most girly Pokemon she ever has, which is Corsola. Okay. But even then, Corsola is, like, more cool than it is cute. It's only, air quotes, girly because it's pink. Yeah, because it's pink. Like, it's, it's just a cool monster. Yeah. And then, you know, we go to Mei, who's also not that great girly. She does contests. Yeah. But then her main Pokemon is Combuskin. Like, <laughs> it's literally a penis. Yeah, he's just a big dick. <laughs> Not that I mean, but hey, hey uh, dicks are girl toys. I suppose so. I was, I was trying to frame that like I did with the baby, yeah. but was, that and was doomed it, to fail yeah. as a joke. And then we got Don, who is probably the most girly or second Serena. most se- second most girly uh, companion character that we've ever had. Okay, now hold on though, hold on though. Uh-huh. I, you're, you're you're on a thing with this, but we have to remember. That Pokemon is also the show that had Ash cross dress like it was no big deal, and it happens a lot now. Yeah, oh, good, <laughs> yeah. The, like it happened in Erica's gym, and then it happens again in some other time. I don't remember, but first it's Erica's gym. But like I love that though, because it's like you have to be a girl to go into this gym, and Ash is like, well, I guess I'll, I guess I'll be a girl now. Yeah. And there's like no, I don't remember if there was any like real resistance or hesitation. Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, that you have to be a girl. It was so first he gets kicked out. He gets banned from the gym oh. because he's like a uh, he's like a not I guess I was gonna say meathead. He's just an idiot. He's like a gross, uh, uncaring idiot about the gym. He's a ten year old boy. Yeah. So like Erica kicks him out. Erica's like, "You're banned from the gym. Oh. Like you don't respect me or anybody who works here or my Pokemon. Get out and you can't come in. You're not gonna get this badge." And so and and Misty and Brock agree with Erica. Oh, Misty and Brock are like, "Well, they're know, fellow gym leaders." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> number one, they're fellow gym leaders. Number two, they're like, "Ash, you were kind of a dick. Like we'll just go to a different gym. It's fine." And Ash is like, "No, I'm gonna go to this gym because I know I can beat them because I have Charmander." And so he go he finds. Team Team Rocket, because he's like, I know who's good at disguises. Oh my god, Team Rocket! I'm like, so he finds Team Clearly Rocket. Clearly, I need to revisit this like, episode. He's like, Team Rocket, I need you to help me. And I'm like, why should we help you, Twerp? And he's like, well, you can get into the gym because they got banned too, because they're idiots. They yeah. So it's like, okay, so we'll dress up as your parents, and you're gonna be our daughter Ashley. And James was like, yeah. I have just the outfit. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, and it was like the the yellow skirt with like the ribbon. Yeah, you know, and he like doesn't talk as much, so he to hide his voice. And even so, though he's literally yeah. voiced by a woman. Yeah, Veronica. T- <laughs> uh, anyways, so they go they go in, uh, and they're like, so then they split up because Jesse and James are there for like some sort of secret perfume that they're gonna sell or whatever, and Ash is there to get the j- the badge. Ash starts a fire in the gym because he's an idiot, and Charmander doesn't know how to control himself. Because he's eager but untrained. And so the fire starts in the gym, and then Ash proves himself to Erica by rescuing the gloom. And then is revealed to be Ash because, like, the dress burns away and it's Ash underneath. And it's in, like, his, in his normal clothes. In his normal clothes. And, and it's Erica's like, you know what? We banned you, but you showed that you're actually, you know, good with Pokemon and you care. So here's the rainbow badge. Uh, I do think that Ash only earns. One badge in Kanto by th- like actually winning. Yeah, by actually winning. I think he beats two. he beats two. He earns two badges. He doesn't beat Brock. He doesn't beat Misty. Um, he doesn't beat oh no three. He earns three. He beats Lieutenant Surge. He doesn't beat Erica. He beats Koga. He doesn't beat Sabrina. That's right. Uh, and he, he beats Blaine. He beats Blaine. Beats Blaine real and, good. And he battles Team Rocket for the eighth badge, which they're nothing. They yeah. they don't know how to use a Pokemon. Like, so, they, they couldn't, like, fight their way out of a paper bag. Like, so, but yeah, like, the the cross-dressing thing. 
Uh, they do it again in multiple seasons. The most recent one, they did it in Sun and Moon. Oh, cool. Because there's an episode where they all work at the Pokemon Center. And to work at the Pokemon Center, you have to be Nurse Joy. So they all dress up like Nurse Joy. <laughs> Amazing. Like, Kiawe's in a Nurse Joy outfit. Ash is in a Nurse Joy outfit. It's really good. And they don't make, like, a big thing no, out of it. No, they don't, make, they don't like, make a big thing out of yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's just okay with it. Everything was just like, okay, well, let's all wear, wear Nurse Joy outfits and work at the Pokemon Center for the day. <laughs> like, and that's cool, yeah. And I think um, that's that's completely a different kind of issue than what we were talking about yeah. with, like, you know, male and female uh, gendered commercialism. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is still cool that in Pokemon... Uh, there isn't there there has never been a huge stigma around gendered clothing. Yeah, there really hasn't been, uh, especially with James as a main character. Well, like, sure, and like you could argue that James is like the camp villain, right? And that's where I was gonna go, and then I was like, not sure if I could tread that territory but properly. No, 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 but like it, it's valid, right? It's a valid criticism, right? But they they humanize him too much to do that. That's true. Like even in the first season, we have like holy matrimony, which is like the James episode where we learn that James like it's actually a really good person and just has shit luck. So like James is that the one where his parents try to marry him off to that crazy yeah, to girl? Jezebel? Jezebel, <laughs> and like who has a victory belt and he's like gonna vine whip him to death? Like, um. Yeah, or not, it's not my victory belt, uh, Vile Plume. Vile and she uses Vile Plume to use stunts more on him to keep him locked up. Ooh. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, like, James is too humanized of a character to be the camp villain now, even in the first season. That's fair. So, and like, and then going through the whole series, James is consistently shown to be the best person in the show to catch Pokemon. Right. He's, he's the best at catching a Pokemon. Because he just, he makes friends with them, and then they join him out of, like, want. It's like the writers were like, alright, we, he's super one-dimensionally, like, flamboyant, uh, pretty villain boy, and uh-huh. we need to steer in the other direction, and then they, like, put their, put a brick on the, on the gas pedal, uh-huh. and... <laughs> and then they walked it back, and then they went back and took two different pathways. Because now he's like, okay, he's still the camp villain, but he's also very smart, and he's also very good at catching Pokemon. Like... It's really cool. It's it's a so that campiness doesn't really get. I, I, it's valid criticism at first, but when they develop him as a character and they keep that development, it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. It's fair. And I guess going back to like the gendering thing, like like I guess the Pokemon anime could be a commercial, like Transformers. It. I mean, really, it is. It, it, I mean, yeah, it is, right? It's a commercial for the games and for the merchandise. Like, look at this cool new Pokemon. Go buy the toy of it. Go buy everything about it. But it doesn't feel like it because, like, they take effort with it. They don't even because they could. They when they were making it, they could have gone with, the, with like the lowest competent denominator and made Misty like a girly girl. And it's like, oh, she loves water. She's a mermaid. You know, she's a girly girl. There's a plenty of girly water Pokemon even in the first generation for her to have. She could have, like, a Squirtle and Goldie Ann Seeking and Dugong and, like, all these girly water Pokemon. But they didn't. And her favorite Pokemon that she's always wanted to catch in the show is Gyarados. Oh, yeah. Like, that's the Pokemon she always wants to have, which is, like, the the most... The, like, the least girly water type in Gen 1. In, like, ca- in case you didn't notice that Misty's a tomboy. Yeah, her favorite Pokemon is Gyarados. Like... <laughs> Oh. So, yeah, like, they... It could have been that. And, yeah, Serena is very girly-girly. She gets the magical fox girl. And I don't know the rest of her team, because I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. All I know is she has breaks, and that's it. But, like... <laughs> I don't know. They could have they could have really gone in that direction with it, and they didn't. And it makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah, I think overall, the... Pokemon realized pretty quick that it was it was for everyone and it didn't have to try and be like a tough boy show or like a super cutesy girl show and yeah. it, it could be either one any day of the week and yeah. everyone would still watch it. And that was even in the games that was a threat by Nintendo of America. So uh, there were a lot of interviews that were done recently uh, and when Pokemon was originally pitched to the West, uh, Nintendo of America asked, "Hey, can we change the monster designs?" Because these aren't going to work in a Western market. They don't want cute animals. And so they pitched Pikachu as like a big buff guy with like electrical attacks. And I'm glad that they put their foot down. And they were like, no, you can't redesign them. Mm -hmm. Like, we already are too far in with Japan. If we're just going to change the, like, we're just going to change the merchandise over to English and sell it here. You cannot change the designs. So it's like, okay, fine. But it's not going to do well. 
That was their threat. Oh no, it's the biggest thing in the world. <laughs> All of my favorite stories about Pokemon are from like, we had no idea it was going to blow up. Yeah. Uh, we got to see... So... We, we've seen almost all of the original English voice cast um, speak at conventions, and my favorite story among them, because, you know, Eric Stewart is very much like an of-the-industry of the businessman. Yeah. Eric Stewart was very, uh, very cold the first time we met him, and very much like, here's what I'm working on now. I don't remember a bunch of the old stuff, you know? Yeah, like, I'm here out of obligation because yeah. they hired me, but... But when I saw him later, when he was there with everybody else, he was way more relaxed and oh, way he's funnier. Chill. Okay. Um, and then Veronica Taylor very much is like, I'm here for the fans. I'm literally crushed that I got fired. Yeah. And then Rachel Lillis, who is the voice of Misty and Jesse and Jigglypuff, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and... The reason why Pikachu has a weird voice in the first couple yeah, of episodes. Yeah, because they didn't. Because they, they thought they were going to localize Pikachu's voice. And then they realized they didn't have to. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's Rachel voicing Pikachu in the first couple of episodes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so her story was about like how she how she lived pretty pretty much like kept to herself in, a, in an apartment in New York and had gone in for the interview for Pokemon kind of on a whim. Yeah. And they... Did you say, like, her friend told her to do it? it well, she... I don't I don't quite remember oh, okay. who told her to do it, but, like, she was at dinner with her parents one night, and her dad was like, no, don't put all your eggs in this basket for this Pokemon thing. It's probably going to be nothing, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, of course, it blows up, but she also didn't notice. Oh, she didn't notice. She didn't, even, she didn't even watch the show. Yeah. Um, and all of her roommates did, and she would ask them, like, how'd I do? Because yeah. she was, like, you know, she was, like, worried about watching herself and it affecting her performance, probably. Yeah. And, uh, and so her friends, her roommates were all like, yeah, we really like it. It's good. It's cute. And then she tells this story, this part where she's on a train. Oh. And she's sitting there, and there's this little girl sitting near her with her face pressed up against the glass. And the kid just goes, Pikachu. And at that moment, oh, Rachel yeah. was like... Oh my god, everybody's <laughs> watching, people are watching this show, and she started to notice it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> like, this is during the span of, like, yeah. the first season of the anime. Yeah, like, they didn't even have the Macy's Day Parade balloon yet. Like, right, right. Yeah. And that was, that was what tipped her off. Like, the little kid mimicking Pikachu on the train, she was like, oh my god, this is yeah. on television. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she was really cool. Honestly, it's, it's always super fun to get that kind of behind-the-scenes stuff. Mm -hmm. There's... There's a lot of media where I wish we got to know more of the story behind certain decisions. Yeah. Because there's so many, so many weird, like, so many weird little things in media. And we get a lot of information. We get a lot of cool interviews. But there's certain, certain celebrities who are dead, certain writers who are dead, certain, like, certain people who are private. Yeah, like, a, or, you know, a company wanting to keep things private. Like, yeah. Just not even going into depth. Like... There's that Satoshi Tajiri book that was made, like that manga about him. Yeah. But like it, it omits a lot of the early Pokemon stuff mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Like it's got like one page of like snapshots of some of the beta designs for Gen 1. Like that's all we had for a long time was the scans of this book that have like a bad snapshot. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and eventually, like, with Pokemon, we did get to learn a lot of the story behind Ooh, its yeah. creation and all uh -huh. of that. That's really cool. Um, uh, and every once in a while I'll think of a series and I'll be like, oh, I really wish I knew, like, I want to be in the room with the, with the writers, like yeah. who pitched this, who pushed this in this direction? What was it almost, what was left on the cutting room floor? Yeah. And it's just a shame that we don't have all of that. Not that we, we're not entitled to any of that. No, but you know? it's very cool to know. And I think that that's like the disconnect is that there are a lot of people out there who like push against this kind of thing who are like, well, we don't need to know that. Like, let's let them. And it's like, it's not that I need to know it. It's that like. And one number one for me personally, a little bit is like the preservation of history. Like it's nice to see the flow of this work, like from conception to work to production to the ending of it. Yeah. Like it's nice to have a nice little story for it, not just the story of the like, not just the story that the work tells, but the story of the work. That I think that deserves to be told and it's nice to preserve. But also like, it's just nice to hear. Like I like I want to hear the human element of this thing. That's where the connections are, you know. For sure, and now, especially now that a lot of us who grew up loving media are turning into creators ourselves. Yeah, it helps to know the creative process, and there's not a lot of resources for that, unfortunately. Yeah. 
So uh, one of the one of the ones I wasn't expecting to get because the show is so old was they did that um, that what do you call like the dramatization yeah. of the creation of the show Doctor Who. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I I was talking about this to you a bit the other day, and it kind of focuses on the the crew that put the show together and the writers, but a lot of it focuses on the impact it had on the guy who was the first yeah, doctor. The guy who played him. Um, and that's, that's an angle I wouldn't even have thought of, you know, cause of course we want to know like the writing process and all of that, but how did it impact the lives of the people who were yeah, involved in it? That's, that, I mean, like going back to what you were just talking about, like how it impacted the lives of the people who played these characters that were some of the most popular cartoon characters in the world. Like, yeah the people who gave them their voice what was life like for them like for eric stewart it was just another job like <laughs> but for veronica taylor it was like her entire identity like that's crazy not that that not that her having her doing that was crazy but the range of yeah the way it affected these people is crazy yeah yeah it's always it's always really fun to find all of that out mm-hmm. um and a lot of the a lot of the other and maybe it's just because the series that they're in are newer but a lot of the other voice actors i've seen um and i think it really is just because their stuff is newer and it's part of a a process that's well understood now you know they they didn't have those same stories Uh, the voice acting industry is fairly well defined now the creative process is a little more streamlined shows are being manufactured based on marketing data from decades yeah and shows aren't like a shot in the dark anymore like they used to like (laughs) Pokemon was a shot in the dark Doctor Who big shot in the dark yeah both of those shows are great examples of like we we are literally winging it with a crazy idea yeah we have no way to know if it'll work. Yeah, and we're just going to do it because we want to. And it works. And, and then people it like it. Yeah, and then it explodes. That is good. Yeah, there's a there's a level of mystique and that's that's what you were saying with the history preservation. Um stuff people wouldn't think twice about nowadays. Yeah, that's the other thing too is that these 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 stories, these human elements of these stories um, they're important because it might not ever happen again, because things are created differently now. We just live in like, and that's not a bad thing. It's the way that the world has changed. Yeah, we live in a society. We live in a society. Oh my god, I hate that, dude. I hate living in a society. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's just how the creative process is now with with productions and shows and things like this now. So you know, people aren't really gonna be on for a show that suddenly blows up because a lot of market data is researched before a show even gets greenlit. So. You know, it, we're never going to have that kind of realization moment for some of these people anymore. <laughs> and so it's important to make sure that they're jotted down, especially because, like, sometimes we don't get enough time with them before they leave. Like, Rip Maddie, you know? Yeah. Like, we, it, it would have been amazing to have more insight and time with Maddie, who provided this fucking Im- immemorial voice for this character. And That's did, Meowth, yeah. Yeah, Meowth. Like, I guess I didn't make it clear to the viewer, sorry. Uh, Meowth's original voice actress, sadly, has passed away. Uh, I think it was like 2011. It was a lot earlier. It was 2008, I think. 2008, yeah, even earlier. Yeah, it was a little bit after uh, her role as Meowth was ended by uh, Pokemon Company. Um, and yeah, so because of that, she didn't get a lot of time post, post-role post to talk about what the role meant to her, what it was like to be Meowth, stuff like that, so... Yeah, I remember that that was a really sad realization because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so as I was watching, because Rachel Lillis was the last of the three voice actors that I saw at a convention. Um, And so, of course, Eric Stewart is Brock and And James. James. Veronica Taylor is Ash. Um, And then Rachel is Jesse and Misty. So I'm like, oh, that's the whole cast. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. I'm forgetting somebody. Yeah. Who's Meow's voice actor? And then I looked it up and I'm sitting there in Rachel's panel Googling... Maddie, uh-huh. realizing that she's dead, and uh-huh. I'm never going to get to see her talk about her career. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of, you know, it was sad for very selfish reasons yeah. on my end, but it was still that, uh, it was it was a, it was was a kind of a shaking moment, you yeah. know? So, because we don't always get a lot of time with these, with these people who, who impact the world in ways that, like, people, you can't even really fathom. Like, you, it, I think it's important to preserve that kind of thing. Like, Satoshi Tajiri isn't always going to be around. You know, uh, Takeshi Shido, the original screenwriter for the Pokemon series, isn't always going to be around. And I hope that you know, our people are able to talk to him and he might be willing to share more about his original vision for the series. Because even though his original vision didn't go through, 
the echoes of it reverberate through the entire show, and it's grown up now because of it. <laughs> Zing, I made it all circle back around. Yeah. It's like poetry. It rhymes. <laughs> <It's>... <sighs> well, we almost made it through this episode without without uh, <laughs> dumb meme references. Then I had to say uh, the society thing, and then you quoted George Lucas. So, so we, we made our quota. <laughs> Don't yell at us in the emails or the comments. We did our meme quota. That's all you're getting. I can't meme anymore. I can't handle it. <laughs> we each get one. We're we're like a we're like a single shot Nerf gun. We come yeah. loaded with one <laughs> one cheesy plastic garbage weapon, and we just pick a sh- pick a random spot and we fire it. And in, in in the Nerf gun or in the Nerf war in the park that is life, you'll find the cheesy foam Nerf dart somewhere in the grass, and then you'll use it. And that's how memes are spread. <laughs> Jeez, what an analogy! Zing! You ever do that? Nerf Wars in the park? Oh yeah, that's fun, dude. We uh, we had uh, so my my version of that in in somehow in later adulthood was lightsaber battles in the park. No, see that's not unheard of. Uh, the evolution of it for our friend group when we were young adults was uh, LARPing with like PVC pipes wrapped in foam. There you go. Yeah, like <laughs> that's actually how. Uh, so a, bu- a buddy of mine was trying to actually get us all into that, uh-huh. and we all made them ourselves, and then that's how uh, uh, my buddy, one of my buddies still has a crescent-shaped scar under his eye to this day. Yep. Uh, boy. Yeah. Do we have an ending segment yet? This is the ending segment. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm wrapping it all up in a neat little bow tie. Yeah, we wrap it up in a bow, and then at the end, we're just sort of like, oh, there's a loose string on this bow, and then we just start pulling it. And we pull it, and then uh, as we fade out, the the music will fade up, and uh, we'll eventually be drowned out by the music. You mean like this? Like this. Okay, weird. (laughs) Yeah, and then maybe this will be left out at the end of the music segment, I'll like cut this, and then I'll put the end of the music segment, and the audience will be like, well, there's there's like 15 more seconds on here, is it just blank? Is it just blank? Or is there something here, and there's nothing?